Welcome to the Spine Guy. I'm Dr. Brian Sue, a fellowship trained spine surgeon in Marin, California. The Spine Guy is a channel dedicated to making the complex spine simple for patients to understand. On the last episode, I talked about the symptoms of degenerative spondylolisthesis. Now you know what spondylolisthesis means. Today we'll be talking about some of the non-surgical treatments of degenerative spondylolisthesis. I'll be posting new videos frequently, so don't forget to hit the subscribe button to catch them as they come out. By now you should have watched the episode on understanding what a degenerative spondylolisthesis is. Just to review, degenerative spondylolisthesis is an abnormal slippage of one bone in front of another. Typically that happens at L4, L5. We'll review some of the imaging quickly again, just to remind you. This is a normal spine where the back of each bone is lined up with each other. This is an abnormal spine where if you trace the back of each bone, you'll see the step off here. This is the spondylolisthesis or the abnormal step off from one bone in front of another. As a result of the spondylolisthesis or slippage, what can happen is there's this narrowing because of the slippage, often because of bone spurs, but often just because of the instability itself. This is a cross section of the spinal canal. You can see that the spinal canal in here is very narrow where really it's supposed to be nice and open. The flexion extension view really shows what happens with gravity over time where you can see slippage of the bone getting worse from when the patient goes from standing to forward flexion. The first thing to understand is that abnormal slippage of one bone in front of another is not a bad thing. It does not have to be surgically fixed. It isn't something where if it doesn't get surgically fixed, the spine is just going to keep becoming more and more unstable and ultimately dislocating and something big and bad is going to happen. That is completely untrue. If you do not have symptoms, back pain, leg pain related to spondylolisthesis, you do not have to do anything for it. It's not dangerous. Even if you do have symptoms, the pain is not an indication that there's abnormal damage happening at all. Many patients see that slippage, they see that compression and say, isn't it bad that there's one bone that really looks completely stepped off? Isn't it bad that there's significant compression? It is not a bad thing. In fact, if you were to image a hundred patients that don't even have pain, many would have this and they don't even know it and it doesn't have to be fixed at all. There's only a couple of caveats to that. Sometimes the compression of the nerves leads to profound weakness or progressive weakness in the ankles, the thighs, the calf, the quadriceps muscles. So if you find yourself getting progressively and progressively weaker, that is more of an urgency. If there are issues related to bowel and bladder control, meaning you're leaking urine because of the nerve compression, you really need to seek a spine practitioner as soon as possible. Otherwise, we always treat symptoms related to a degenerative spondylolisthesis non-surgically first. I think of my practice, of all the people I see with a degenerative spondylolisthesis, only about 10 to 20% ultimately get surgery, and 80 to 90% are pretty well treated non-surgically. So there's two ways to treat the instability and the pinched nerve associated with a spondylolisthesis. One is to shrink the nerve so that the nerve can learn to live in a small space. Typically what happens with initial onset of nerve pain, the nerve got irritated and because it's irritated in a small place, there's a cycle of inflammation. Now it's more inflamed in a small space. Now it gets more and more irritated. So the idea is to stop the cycle of inflammation, shrink the nerve so I can learn to live in a small space. This is typically done with physical therapy, medications, epidurals, and we'll talk about those. That's today's episode. The other way to treat the instability in the pinched nerve is obviously what I do, which is surgery. That's a permanent fix where I go in there, take the bone spurs off the nerve, which is called a decompression. And often we stabilize the spine with rods, screws, cages to prevent the abnormal motion. That is the permanent fix to the structural problem. However, the structural problem doesn't always have to be fixed as long as we're able to control the pain and give patients good quality of life. So the first thing I'd recommend a patient with initial onset buttock and leg pain is good physical therapy and core strengthening. Physical therapy strengthens the core and it strengthens the muscles around the spine so that the muscles take the load instead of the discs, instead of the bone spurs, and so sometimes that can help. Medications can be a great solution for lumbar spinal stenosis. Typically what happens is a patient has pre-existing narrowing, they do something, whether they travel or they go to the gym, and the nerve starts to get pissed off and swollen, and now it's pissed off and swollen in a small space, so there's a cycle of inflammation. So the idea is to break the cycle of inflammation. That can be done with medications. 
such as anti-inflammatories or nerve medications. There's three basic categories of medications. The first category of medications we might prescribe is called anti-inflammatories. Anti-inflammatories are either NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, and those include things like ibuprofen, Aleve, etc. The most important thing about an anti-inflammatory is to remember to take it consistently because you really have to break that cycle of inflammation. So in the case of ibuprofen, you would take 800 milligrams three times a day, 14 days straight with food. In the case of Aleve, you would take two tablets in the morning, two tablets at night, 14 days straight again with food. You have to build that baseline level of anti-inflammatory up to actually have an effect. You can't just take the anti-inflammatory when you have pain. The second class of anti-inflammatories is steroids. Steroids are a very strong anti-inflammatory. I don't suggest them taking them along with NSAIDs. NSAIDs are over the counter. Steroid is something that has to be prescribed, but something I would typically prescribe is prednisone. Prednisone is oral steroid. It goes everywhere in the body, and it's usually in a taper. I personally prescribe 60 milligrams a day, 50, 40, 30, 20, 10, which is a five-day taper dose. One thing to be wary of with prednisone is that it can have certain side effects like blood sugar elevation, it can make you manic, that's where the term roid rage comes from, uh, but prednisone is the strongest anti-inflammatory we have and I will typically prescribe that if somebody comes in with 10 out of 10 pain. The second type of medications that we might prescribe are narcotics. So narcotics are opiates and you've heard about the opiate crisis, but sometimes narcotics are needed when the pain is really bad. The two general types are Norco or Percocet. Both of these are combination drugs. Norco is a combination of hydrocodone plus Tylenol, which is just over-the-counter Tylenol. Hydrocodone is really the, the opiate or the narcotic, but it's a combined drug. Percocet is a combination of oxycodone plus Tylenol, and their oxycodone is the opiate or narcotic. Oxycodone is stronger than hydrocodone. The reason I've circled Tylenol is because people die from Tylenol overdosages all the time. You hear about it. The maximum amount of Tylenol you should be taking if you're taking these combined drugs is 3 grams or 3,000 milligrams of Tylenol at once. Tylenol is also known as acetaminophen. And it's always interesting to me because we regulate opiates so much, but actually what could kill you is the Tylenol could send you into acute liver failure. The third type of medicine we typically prescribe is something called a nerve medication. These are medications that trick your brain into thinking that you don't have nerve pain. There are two basic types. One is Neurontin, that's the brand name, that is exactly the same as Gabapentin, which is its scientific name. The other one is Lyrica, which is the brand name, and Pregabalin is its scientific name. These nerve drugs are interesting. In my experience, they tend to help probably 50% of the time, and they can have significant side effects. They can make you hallucinate, loopy, sleepy. These are drugs that if you look at the side effects, you're gonna say, no way am I gonna take these. However, in my experience, if you start at a low dose and slowly ramp up, you can see if you have those side effects, and if you do, you obviously stop taking it. Another very powerful and commonly used non-surgical intervention for spinal stenosis is doing something called an epidural steroid injection that involves taking a needle and either putting it inside the spinal canal or outside the spinal canal over the nerve. So that's either called a translaminar epidural steroid injection or a selective nerve injection. And these are basically ways to take the most powerful anti-inflammatory we have, which is steroid, and coating the nerve to stop the cycle of inflammation and to calm the nerve down. Again, the injection doesn't fix the problem. It doesn't take the compression off the nerve, but it breaks the cycle of inflammation. An epidural injection essentially involves going into a surgery center typically, and the epidural injection is sometimes done by spine surgeons, but usually by pain anesthesia doctors or by a physiatrist, but an epidural steroid injection is essentially the doctor taking a needle and targeting over the nerve, injecting a little bit of steroid and the steroid calms the nerve down. The epidural steroid injection is typically an outpatient procedure. It takes about 20 minutes. Usually we tell patients not to work that day, but they can work after that. And to try to stay laying low for one or two weeks because you want the medicine to stay around that area. Epidural steroid injections can sometimes be very effective immediately, meaning within the first couple of hours because sometimes there's local anesthetic. But an important thing to remember about epidural steroid injections is that it can take up to two weeks to work. And sometimes the pain can even be worse in the first couple of days. Do not lose hope if you get the epidural and it hasn't helped in it's 10 days. I would wait the full 14 days. 
If patients fail conservative care after six months and still have pain, and that pain is affecting quality of life, surgery is an outstanding option for degenerative spinal volusiasis. Surgery is typically indicated after six months of symptoms that have failed to respond to conservative care, meaning physical therapy, medications, epidurals, and mostly surgery is indicated when pain is interfering with quality of life. So what does that mean? There's only really two questions when it has to do with whether or not you need to have surgery for lumbar spinal stenosis. One, if the pain is affecting your physical quality of life, you can't do the things you wanna do. You can't travel, you can't hang out with your family, your friends, because of the buttock and leg pain. The second is emotional quality of life, which is just as important as physical quality of life. Buttock and leg pain can cause significant emotional distress. This causes depression, downheartedness, it causes you to be irritable. It can actually affect you psychiatrically significantly. So ultimately, if you're still having buttock pain, back pain, and leg pain, and it's affecting your physical and emotional quality of life, surgery plus minus surgical stabilization is an outstanding option for degenerative spondylolisthesis, and we'll be talking about surgery options on the next episode. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to click the like button and leave questions or feedback in the comment box below. Feel free to let me know what videos you would like to see in the future.